Hello and welcome to this follow-up webinar um, following the PCPLD Networks webinar last week on the 16th of September on are we prepared for the end of life care of people with learning disabilities. If you've missed that webinar there'll be a link um, below this video and you can watch it again. Now during that webinar Baroness Elora Finlay raised the issue of resuscitation and she said that a blanket DNR decision is illegal. Now that comment caused a lot of confusion and quite a few questions. So we thought it would be really helpful to explore that a little bit further and to ask Baroness Finlay to expand on what she meant by those comments. So I spoke to her yesterday. Um, I've also spoken to Yolanda van Boven in the Netherlands who is the mother of 20-year-old Floortje and who is telling us about her experiences with resuscitation requests. So let's listen to them and see whether we can just unpick some of these really complex and difficult issues, starting with Yolanda. Um, nou ja, I'm Yolanda, I'm the mother of uh, three children and um, our eldest daughter is Floortje and she has Red syndrome. It's a genetic disorder and so she is, um, yeah, she can do anything about herself. She is completely um, disabled and uh, I have to do everything for her and with her. So, um, but she's a nice uh, girl. She's always laughing, not always, but she's laughing a lot. And um, we think she has, uh, uh, she likes life. So, um, she likes it with us and with her brother and with her sister. And uh, maybe I can uh, show you a little bit uh, of Floortje. <laughs> this is our daughter, Floortje. And here she is 18 and a friend of us uh, paint her. Uh, so yeah, this is what you see is what you get uh, with Floortje. So this is uh, when she's good, then she's laughing. And when she's not so good, then she is uh, a little bit sad and then we are sad too, but in the uh, regularly she's, uh, yeah, it's a nice girl and she enjoys life. A few years ago, uh, we have to go to the hospital because uh, she had a little uh, examination and therefore she has a, a, an intoxicating, yes, um, that happens uh, uh, before and every time that went uh, all right. So there was not planned a night in the hospital and we were planned to go uh, to uh, at home when we are ready. But red uh, syndrome uh, showed his bad side. So um, Floortje did not come properly uh, out of the, uh, the narcosa. I don't say if it's the right word. And uh, her vital fun functions went uh, all directions, so the, the alarms are peeping and um, the anesthetist looks very um, complicated and difficult. And he said to me, I go um, study Red Syndrome again because I don't uh, know what to do uh, with this. Um, I, I know it's because this happens um, every time then a red syndrome caused a, lo a lot of um, dysfunction to heart and to uh, breathing and when she is uh, on the uh, when she how do you say that ventilator the, yes then uh, everything going up and down that's that's here to red syndrome uh, so I said, it's okay, we take her home and then it's gone, all right. But he said, no, we, you didn't take her home. We um, bring her to the intensive care unit. And, um, and then he said, uh, and then I have to ask you, uh, should or shouldn't we uh, resuscitate your daughter? So, and then I uh, completely... Yeah, was out of order. This this is not this was so unexpected for me that question. Um, so I I said, what is she going to die now? 
that was my uh, response. I thought, um, yeah, am I underestimating the, the situation in the, uh, so much? Is it so much harder than I think? Um, now, then he uh, said, um, it's okay. She, uh, I don't think she's going to die, but when uh, your daughter goes to the intensive care unit, then we have to ask uh, that question to everybody. That's a standard question. So at that moment, I think it's, uh, for me, it's not standard. And <laughs> uh, but at that moment, I didn't have to uh, think about it and I couldn't uh, yeah, think about the, the strange situation. So at that moment, I said, of course, you have to recitate her and uh, then we go to the, to the intensive care. And that was the first time I was confronted with a question like this. And um, yes, because of the situation and the, the fear and uh, my, um, I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, it was not a moment to think about uh, what that question mean for me. Um, and that it for me was a strange question at that moment. But yeah, it, he said, uh, it is a standard. So... Um, I think that everybody uh, is that is in a, the same position as I was with Floortje at that time, uh, get the same question at that moment. But I never had uh, an investigation after that um, to, to ask if that is, is right, is, is that for everybody uh, that way. Yeah. yeah, I think, and I think that's such a, that's such a good question because as you, I've also got a daughter who's 20. She's the same age as your daughter. Um, yeah. She goes to university. And I, I mean, she's never been into intensive care, but I really wonder whether the doctor would ask me that same question. If she didn't come out of the anesthetic properly and she had to go into intensive care, I'm not sure they would ask me that. So that is worth yeah, thinking about and discussing, I think. So thank yes. you. Yeah. Yes. And have you talked to um have you talked to other parents? Uh, of of because you are you are act you know a lot of other parents of, of sons and daughters with Red Syndrome. Yes, I'm uh, active in the uh, community community for uh, Red Syndrome and I speak to other uh, elder uh, other parents. But this is a difficult um, yeah, thing to talk about. So um, I, I know that uh, the question is asked uh, um, that, they, that this, this parents also get these questions in this situation or when uh, a child has come in the ambulance for something or um, is in uh, trouble and comes in the hospital. So that's a kind of standard question for uh, a few parents. So, but I don't know uh, in what you said, how it is for parents, uh, they have a health child. Thank you, Yolanda, for sharing that story with us. Very powerful. And also particularly thank you for doing that in English, which I know is not a language you're totally familiar with. So very well done and thank you. So I've showed that video clip that you've just seen, my conversation with Yolanda, to Baroness Elora Finlay, who spoke at our webinar last week. Baroness Finlay is a professor of palliative medicine at Cardiff University, and she's also a past president of the Royal Society of Medicine. And she's been an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords for almost 20 years, raising issues around mental capacity. Um, she chairs the um, National Ment Mental Capacity Forum. So here is, for example, a question she asked in the House of Lords earlier today. This is the 21st of September. Baroness Findlay of Clandaff. My Lords, I declare I chair the National Mental Capacity Forum and am an elected member of the BMA Ethics Committee. All treatment decisions must be individualised. 
made based on the likelihood of benefit to the person, considering their wishes and feelings, and without prejudice of age, disability, or other pre-existing conditions. Will the government continue to work with the forum to ensure this is known and understood properly across health and social care in all sectors? Uh, the Noble Baroness puts it extremely well that all treatments uh, should be uh, individualised and tailored to the patient's needs and requirements. Uh, I applaud the work of the Forum. We're committed to continuing that work, and uh, it is an important part of our correspondence with trusts that these kinds of principles and standards are upheld and advertised. So I started off my conversation with Baroness Finlay by showing her this, um, this conversation I had earlier in the day um, with Yolanda and asked her um, what she thought about the doctor's question to her should or should we not resuscitate your daughter? You know, to, what a, an incredibly blunt and stupid question because she's going into intensive care. So they're planning to try to do something to save her. The French would call it reanimation, reanimation, you know. But yet the, com the question should be, we are going to try to do everything we can for your daughter. But in the unlikely event that things go in the wrong direction and her heart stops, how vigorous should we be? Or should we say, if her heart stops at that point, we would accept natural death. We would accept that she's died. Or, or should we give her external cardiac massage and try to defibrillate her? I think that's the real question. And the danger is the shortcuts. Because to say, shall we resuscitate her? Well, does that mean you're not going to reverse an overdose of opioids with naloxone? What about if she's hypo? Are you not going to give her some sugar if she's hypoglycemic? If her calcium is deranged, are you not going to treat it with a bisphosphonate? If she drops her blood pressure, are you just going to leave it? Or are you going to at least raise her feet, give her some fluids, possibly use some inotropes? And what about oxygen? Are you not going to, you know, to say we won't resuscitate means you're not going to monitor her oxygen or anything. because. You monitor oxygen, you give someone oxygen, that's resuscitating them. If they're unconscious and they're anoxic, and if that's the reason they're deeply unconscious, hopefully they will regain consciousness if it's from anoxia. So the terribly dangerous thing is that phrase, do not resuscitate, which means don't do anything, abandon everything when actually it's a shortcut, a really dangerous shortcut, because it doesn't state where the boundaries are. It doesn't state, this is how much we will do, and at this point, this is how much we will do, and at this point, we will accept that the disease process is going inevitably towards death, and we will accept natural death. And we won't jump up and down on her chest and risk breaking her ribs. And we won't defibrillate. And you know the extreme in CPR, sometimes when people are brought in off the street <clears throat> and they've got a stab wound, you open their chest. You literally open their chest in the emergency department because you've got to do something about the hole that's there through the ventricle bleeding out. What about somebody who's brought in unconscious bleeding out? A label, do not resuscitate. Well, crumbs, clamp the artery, give them some fluids, give them a blood transfusion. Hopefully they will regain, not only regain consciousness, but if you do it quickly enough, they may not lose brain function from that period of a very low blood pressure. So it's an incredibly dangerous thing to say, do not resuscitate. It's like, we'll abandon you. 
I think, I mean, it's so, and it is so confusing, isn't it? Uh, we hear this so often, and as you know, this was the one thing about the webinar we did last week that people were really asking questions about, and we didn't really have time to, you know, to go into it. But can you maybe explain a bit more then what you meant by saying that a DNAR is illegal? Okay. Because that's worried people a bit and, and, and I think there is confusion about as you already explained a little bit about the wording of that and, and exactly what you just expand on that yeah. because okay so first of all you cannot make blanket decisions you cannot say everybody in this nursing home is not for cardiopulmonary resuscitation or everybody in this place is not even for IV fluids or Everybody here is not for antibiotics if they become septic. Those, you cannot do that. Each decision must be made on the individual. And then for the individual, each decision must be based on the likelihood of them, of them responding to an intervention. So you could call it ceilings of care. People have tried to use that as a phrase to define where you set the boundary. But just to say, do not resuscitate, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to the nurse who comes on duty, the patient's diabetic, they find them in a coma, somebody's written do not resuscitate. Does that mean that they know they're diabetic? Does that mean they don't do a blood sugar? Because if their blood sugar is low and you give them some glucagon or you give them some glucose, they'll wake up. You know, they'll be fine. But if you don't, they'll be dead. So it's incredibly dangerous. And I don't think it will stand up in a court of law. When somebody dies and you've got do not resuscitate written down, do you really mean don't do anything? bring them back from that near death state they're in? Or do you mean we're not going to attempt CPR, which is the ultimate, which is the ultimate? Or we might try CPR for a short time, but actually if they don't come too quickly, we won't carry on because the chance of brain damage will be greater. You must be precise in what you're deciding in advance that you won't be doing. I think that is so true because I think lots of people sort of understand that term resuscitate, do not resuscitate, actually to mean the stuff you see on, on TV, you know, in, in, in the that where it gets people back yeah. from the brink, you know, with, with jumping on people's chest. But, but so you're saying it's actually saying it's actually difficulty and, and when you said it's illegal it's it's because it, it means something much wider and that is not not legal. telling you that it means something much wider but i don't think it would stand up in a court of law to to say oh in my defense i let this person bleed out onto the floor I let this diabetic die in a hypoglycemic coma. I let this accidental narcotic overdose die because they had someone had written on their notes, do not resuscitate. Because that's what that phrase would mean to somebody coming along. I hope nobody would obey, do not resuscitate, unless they were absolutely clear uh, that it, it only means do not attempt CPR and there's another aspect to it too. You cannot make that decision on somebody unless either they've agreed or the person who has power in law to make that best interest decision on their behalf so they have lasting power of attorney or they're a court appointed deputy or they are the designated person with whom you're communicating, you must involve them as well. You don't just write it down. Yeah, because that is actually quite useful. There's one question, I'm just reading and looking at it here. One question that was asked during your, our webinar was, yeah. whose decision is it if a person doesn't have the capacity 
you know, to, to make the decision and no family is involved, but the DNR is okay. The DNR issue. Okay. The DNR issue is not the right thing. But can you say no, who decides then if there is nobody right. involved? If the person cannot make the decision for themselves over what they want and what they don't want done, then the clinician is making a best interest decision. And there are some rules about that. It must be in the interests of the patient as a person. It cannot be motivated to bring about their death. And you must consult people who know the person. So if there are any relatives at all, or there may be neighbours or friends or somebody who's come in with them. Now, in the emergency situation, you know, where, where somebody's brought in unconscious, you don't know what, what's going on, you haven't got a clue, you need to make lots of quick decisions. You ask, does anybody know them? Can we try and get some relatives on the phone? You know, you, know, you look at their mobile phone, you see what you can do. But you must consult as much as you can reasonably. If the person lacks capacity, but they, for that decision at that time, whatever the decision is, but they have some capacity and they have some degree of consciousness, you must still involve them. So you must say, we are going to do this, and but we're not going to do that. We will be treating you, but we won't do anything that would cause you pain or distress okay so you you need to explain it in very simple terms but you still must involve the person you can't just play god and make a decision over their head yeah that's i mean that's really helpful and, and so just coming back to the word blanket decisions yeah. That could either mean, or it probably means both, a, a decision that is the same for everyone in you know, a dreadful situation where everybody in a, in a, in a care home was sent these forms yes. for DNR. I mean, clearly that is, that is illegal. I can see that. Yes. Um, but could it also mean a blanket sort of order for this person, whatever happens to them? It sounds like what you have to do if you write things down is you have to be very specific of yeah. which decision and under which circumstances. Yeah, exactly. It's absolutely, it's both types of blanket decision. So for the individual, it isn't just don't do anything because that implies you're abandoning care, but you need to define. So supposing this young lady who we've heard about develops a malignancy, then you would say, well, this is the amount of chemotherapy that we may try, but in the event, we may not go as far as we might with somebody else, but you would plan it out and negotiate it. In the event of her becoming septic, we will, I hope they would treat her with IV antibiotics, uh, but there may be a point where people say, but she's on her third lot of antibiotics, this seems to be antibiotic resistant, and we're making a decision that we're now not going to try any more because the tumour's grown further or whatever. But you must be quite specific as to what the decision is and why you're making it and write it down so that you're thinking through, you're planning ahead for all the likely eventualities that you can see. Thank you. That's just so helpful. And I think maybe sort of as a final question to you is, so if Yolanda, this mother of Florcia, has to go into hospital with her again, and yes. the same happens again, and she needs to go in intensive care, and the, and, and the doctor say, Do you, would you like a that happens to parents all the time, parents of people with particularly more profound disabilities. What is your advice to how they should what they could do or how they should respond? Because she was telling me that some of the parents that she knows hear this question constantly. Yes. Every time a daughter is picked up in an ambulance or goes into A&E, 
every time the ambulance people at ANE staff will ask them, do you want us to resuscitate her? What is your advice for those situations? I think the first question is, what do you mean by resuscitation? What treatment are you asking that you would or would not give? So force clarity. The next question is, do you mean cardiopulmonary resuscitation? Do you mean CPR only in the event that her heart stops and she has a reversible rhythm that you would not try to reverse it? That really pins people down because when your heart stops, the two most likely things are either that you've got no electrical activity, so you have a flat trace. Now, it's extremely rare to resuscitate people from that with an electric shock across the heart. But if they've got a disordered rhythm, so the trace is going like this all over the place, and the heart can't pump properly because it's going like this and nothing's coming out. Then if you give an electric shock across that, you quite often restore a pumping mat. You quite often restore a pumping. OK, so it's so that would be a rever potentially reversible disordered rhythm. And that would take an electric shock across the heart, and that might sort it out. If you pin people down to what they mean, you'll get better care and better clarity. So I would like every parent to feel empowered to say, what do you mean by resuscitation? I want everything done to treat my daughter or son or whoever it is, if that's what they feel, or they, if that's what they feel, or they may say, we've agreed that at this point we wouldn't do any more. And then the next question is, is it cardiopulmonary resuscitation with external cardiac massage and cardioversion if their heart stops? and really pinning that down. If people want to see a video about and some training on what CPR involves, if they go to Talk CPR, then that's a website that in Wales we've put together to help people understand what cardiopulmonary resuscitation means, what CPR means, a specific intervention. I think if they want to find out about CPR, go to talk CPR. If they want to find out about best interest decisions, they can go on the SCI, S-C-I-E website for the National Mental Capacity Forum. And they can also go to Alex Rutkeen's um, little videos that he's made over best interest decisions. They're extremely good. The BMA has produced some guidance on best interest decisions. It's written down, so it's a bit harder to absorb than when somebody is speaking and demonstrating something. Um, and that is really written more for doctors than for relatives, but it's available to everybody. Um, and I think the next, well, the next thing that we're going to try and do through the National Mental Capacity Forum is focus very specifically on best interest decisions because I worry that they are not being made well and safely. And there is, uh, there is a court case, there's been a court ruling that you do not make a decision that you're not going to attempt CPR on somebody. Uh, without their consent, if they could have consented. To do, to do so is not legal. You must seek consent. Okay. So that was just so helpful, Elora. Thank you so much for making the time to explain that a little bit more.
Um, I'm sure it will cause a lot of discussion and questions, but that's a really important conversation to have. And we've got some really useful resources here and some very valuable insights and expertise. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming back to me and giving me a chance to explain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elora and Yolanda, for helping us to think about the, the issues of resuscitation. I found it really helpful. I've learned from it. I hope you have too. If you have further questions or comments, do let us know. Email us at info at pcpld.org or you can follow us on Twitter, send us tweets. Um, we will pick up your questions and your messages. I'm also really delighted to announce that there will be a whole series of lunchtime webinars on any issues related to the end of life care of people with learning disabilities. Um, so again, if you have ideas about that, then do let us know. Thank you.